components of the curriculum which which address the issues which we are looking at like uh, if students are facing some emotional challenges in the world then let's add a few things into the way the curriculum is delivered so that they are emotionally strong uh, to face the challenges which world is going to throw them at and uh, they are ready for the challenges which no none of us know today uh, they are ready for the jobs which don't exist today uh, they are ready for the kind of assessments which we think should be there but is not today so these are the few things i think we i will take with me uh, which i feel we definitely uh, as educators can implement in our schools without uh, impacting the current way of assessment which unfortunately is the reality So in the last decade or so, I think our classrooms in the pedagogy and the delivery has undergone some amount of change. We went into blended learning, the use of technology as well as uh, you know our lecture methods. We've been doing some amount of flipped learning, reciprocal or peer learning. We've been doing multimedia based, project based, all of that. I'm sure all of that helps. If I were to uh, kind of very uh, succinctly put this, I think we are still, the teacher tells, I still get, I think we are still in the telling mode. And what the Professor said earlier, how can we move away from the discipline to one of encouragement? I think that's going to be the fundamental way that teachers, if you can move away from telling and just get into asking, life will be so much easier. But you know what, I, I did this one time, um, some of you may have read the book uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. He talks about this tipping point and you know 10,000 hours of mastery. Unless you actually do it for 10,000 hours, it's not your knee jerk reaction. Now teachers, contemporary teachers have been doing knee jerk reaction of telling 10,000 hours or more. Unless we put in 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 hours of tell, not telling but asking, we won't move from the discipline to the encouragement. Mm. I think that's, that's going to be the key. I think when we start teacher training, I think we have to focus on do not tell, ask, do not tell, ask and do that 5,000 times before you actually become the new age teacher. I guess uh, there is consensus amongst all of us maybe that uh, the monologue based uh, pedagogical approach has given way to the dialogue based pedagogical approach. And I guess uh, that is something that will uh, stay. Uh, we all agree with that. Uh, there is something that Professor Mitra said uh, uh, which I have uh, seen in my own experience is that if you can capture the child's imagination and its attention uh, that's the time when learning happens the most. Uh, so the question is, can we capture his imagination and his attention in the classroom? Uh, the two things that I can tell you from my own experience is, uh, Manjula spoke about flipped classroom, and uh, we really think that that really works, that the flipped classroom model, uh, wherein uh, there is rich discussion within the classroom uh, without it just being curriculum transaction. So uh, the idea is for the kids to go out there and mine that information themselves, come back and the teacher then facilitates rich discussion. It, it definitely happens in higher ed, right? When we think about uh, some of the best Ivy League colleges, they do the rich discussion in the classroom. Uh, uh, the other is, um, uh, you, know, you have all heard about the uh, phenomenon-based learning uh, there, and I heard about this about a couple of years back, and Finland, how it moved from uh, subjects to topics. Uh, and I really uh, wanted to try that uh, uh, with my own son, uh, who was 12. Uh, and I took up a phenomenon called Brexit uh, and decided to uh, go in to probably discussing with him about economy, which is uh, about commerce, uh, about geography, because I could tell him about Brexit and what happened as geography. Uh, I could tell him a lot about uh, the effect of it and a little bit of a history as well. So you could take a phenomenon called Brexit and kind of go into so many things. And I really think that uh, a topic based rather than a subject based um, kind of a pedagogical approach uh, is something that could work. Uh, Finland is experimenting with it. 
I, I guess it will be successful because I could see that there is interest that you could spark with the phenomenon. Um, I think the million dollar question from us, so what, what next? Um, of course, I don't have an immediate short term solution, but I think one of the big, big factors that we as a country need to do is to attract the best talent into teaching. We as a country do not attract the best talent into teaching and while I'm not talking about this August hall that I have in front of me, all of you all are probably educationists out of heart, out of passion. Uh, but very honestly, you are all basically educators of a privileged group of schools. Um, that's not where India is. If you look at the kind of people getting into education, uh, when you ask them, why did you choose to become a teacher? A lot of them, the honest answer is, you know, I thought, I got married, so my family said, you know, just do teaching, it'll be easy, you'll spend some time with the children, and it'll be good, do that. That's not what teaching is. Teaching is the most important profession according to me. Teaching is the only profession that creates every other profession in the world. All of you, all of us are actually in the miracle business. We are creating miracles or putting a lid on that miracle. Uh, so we need as a country to be able to attract the best educators. Of course financially is one important factor but even more important is respect. People talk about Finland and how their education system is very good, of course it is. Um, you can't necessarily just take it and parachute it into India, of course it has to be customized. Uh, but one of the biggest factors that work in favor of Finland is the quality of the educators. Their teachers are actually experts. I've, I've visited places in Finland for about three weeks just studying the education system and I found PhDs who are teaching preschools. It's unheard of in India. You will never have a PhD qualified person teaching preschools. In India, the more qualified you are, you just have to teach the higher grades. Um, I think my one biggest thing that I would like you to leave, leave you with is that let us build respect for our teachers. Let us actually make this profession a desirable profession, not the last case scenario. That's well said. I mean, all we respect and uh, you know, our teachers, uh, it's so critical in you know, any society. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Um, I think coming to teachers, it's very important that we enable them as well. You know, technology is not a threat, so please don't take it in whatever ways that it's not a threat, it's definitely not going to replace you. You cannot have those connects uh, with these students, uh, you know, uh, you can have rather a better uh, connection with these students with technology. Uh, I'll probably stick to little technology right now is, there are, you know, areas where instead of learning a subject, make them feel the subject. So use immersive technology, augmented reality, virtual reality as tools to make them experience that. So the experience that they will carry, is, is going to help them in their, uh, their their learning. The teachers using different tools is going to teach different. You you going to use tools to make you also feel that okay, I'm doing something different today. You know things like you know if you have an augmented reality, virtual reality, you teaching them you know heart popping out, telling them this is right ventricle, this is right ventricle. The child is feeling with a you know stylus in his hand is doing the entire shift in technology can help the child to remember and we have done that in some schools where the small kids just wore those 3D glasses and wore that. The excitement not only on the child's face but even the parents who were outside was phenomenal, right? So the, the thinking part that uh, you know, Stan mentioned is so critical. You, you have to enable that and technology definitely uh, does some of these part, right? While we are talking about virtual reality, the fact is reality is also virtual for us. Right? So very important that we how do we use some of these technology uh, to enable and give that experience that uh, you know child is looking at. There are schools which cannot afford to have people, you know, kids traveling. How can you make some of those things available to them here? And that you know the cost wise it can translate to fifty rupees per child per month. So it's not expensive as well. Affordable, absolutely affordable, right? So encourage to use technology. Uh, Whatever is coming up, immersive technology from that perspective, it will help teachers, it will help, please enable teachers. And if there is any way we can help, we will be more than glad to do that. Thank you.
<coughs> I think um, if you look at pedagogy and you look at how adaptive it has been, so we have the IB system from the 1960s that has a unit of inquiry kind of learning, or the latest EL foundation of the 1993 that's project based learning. Look at how old these systems are, 1993 being probably the latest one. So old, and look at every other industry, whether it's banking, it's auto, it's, it's finance, everything is changing by the year. There are new products, there are new things because people keep evolving. Why can't we have an education system that allows for pedagogy to evolve every year? Because the change is just too fast. We can't wait for pedagogies to get research. And pedagogy has to be researched. Okay, you need to follow a child for 20 years to see what is the result of that. But to wait for those papers to come out and use them, is it's too slow. So uh, two things. I think topic-based learning is very good because it's live and active to what's happening in the world. And continuously using people of the world to keep talking to children about what is their take on it is helping children children understand from multiple points of view and, and it's also giving teachers a new way of learning so bringing people in from industry from government from all over the world continuously into classrooms to talk on those topics that they're learning about keeps with the time because you have someone from Finland come and talk to your classroom you may have someone else from somewhere else come and talk that's a breast with today and it helps evolution every year so I think that's important we can't coin pedagogy as this one works better than that one because it will keep changing and also it's native to places as he also rather rightly said Finland has its own way because it has its own systems our weird education I remember last school news event only that one lady said you know my me and my daughter and my daughter's daughter have all done weird and the curriculum hasn't changed so imagine how are we going to adapt and change to that, right? We, we can't suddenly change that and bring something else that works somewhere else. But we can start making these small changes by bringing topics and people into everyday classrooms to keep abreast of the world every time. Okay, so that was very interesting, I thought, from the pedagogy uh, discussion. Because we went, uh, on the one hand, from uh, experimentation, that we, one of the things that we can see clearly is that you have to try some new things uh, and uh, we also can see what those new things might be uh, onwards to the motivation of teachers that how do we get teachers and I think the two things are actually kind of connected with each other if the teacher sees her job as a 9 to 5 uh, doing the same thing over and over again correcting exercise books then they are not going to get the best people to come and be teachers but if that job definition could be changed to a more uh, flexible, more experimental kind of job then I can imagine a situation where the PhDs will start coming back into teaching from there we went on to the role of technology and the fact that the learner probably expects technology. Now I haven't thought of that that way because I'm often in a way somewhat anti-technology. So why do you want to put technology if it's not required? But required as by whom? By me? <laughs> what if it is required by the, by the student and the learner? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of value in thinking of, of it that way. That uh, is your student anticipating the technology uh, and that's the kind of example I was giving you where a, where a child says that why are you asking me this question after taking away my phone so that, that's a direct uh, sort of a difference in that generation and uh, and then on, on to uh, the use of new technology uh, for whatever pedagogical purpose so I, if I have to you know, the, the kind of uh, summary I'm getting, if it makes any sense in the case of pedagogy is to say that we shouldn't make the top-down mistake again that we made uh, and continue to make in technology. Remember I was saying governments will fund science hoping that technology will drop out of the bottom and it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, often enough it works the other way about the technology is created by tinkerers and then the scientists are asked to explain how that worked. So I think in education, in this fast changing scenario, we need to think of pedagogy in that sense. You try it, you tinker with it and you see what works and what doesn't. If I look at hole in the wall, I didn't have a theory and people used to ask me that, that why are you doing this? I didn't even know, I was just fiddling around. And then came all the pedagogues to explain what is happening there. 
So maybe we should drive the system that way, drive it backwards. Uh, you have the scope to do that, particularly in early years training because the standardized testing is a little less, even though they have now, I believe, brought it to fifth standard. <laughs> but anyway, that fifth standard test, as far as I can tell, is to test you, test the teacher rather than test the children. So, so forget that. <laughs> uh, but if we can experiment, if we can experiment with technology, get the companies to, co to cooperate with that sort of experimentation, give them the data back, uh, ask them to change their machinery. Uh, if we can experiment with pedagogical methods and find out what works, if we can experiment with assessment. And when you have concrete results that everybody is getting, mm -hmm. then go to the academicians and say, now you explain it. Then go to the psychologists and say, you explain it. That I think is what is happening to souls actually. Because teachers all around the world, whoever has tried it, including teachers inside this audience, have all got the same results. So they all want to now know that, okay, tell me what is the theory then? How does it work? Is it spontaneous order? Is it something else or whatever? So, so I think in the, in the sum total of it, for the, for the first round of our discussion, uh, we could maybe take uh, now not just your comment on, uh, on pedagogy, but your comment on all three. And once again, I will have to restrict to uh, three comments max, okay? Mainly because uh, we need to close up to that. Yeah, but they can go from the back. Okay, so you, you choose. Gentlemen <laughs> over. While we speak and we become very pessimistic about not, there has not been enough change in curriculum, pedagogies and all. But we must remember that for 30, 40 years as in, as in India, we were comfortable because with this system, our people were taking over Silicon Valley and Infosys and PCs. It is only the recent 5, 10 years that threat perception has come in. And that is, and as I sit here, I realize that we are a much more smarter bunch as teachers and educators than even Sunil Mittal's Aditya Bhaglars and all because in last one year or two years, Geo finished them up. They were very brilliant people, still they spent so much money. But technology changed them. And today as educators, we are all underlyingly worried that robotics might take over our schools and our jobs. That threat perception is making us worried and want to find solutions. And solutions will automatically come once that threat per we, 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 we as a human race have to survive. So, underlying this threat is very good for us. And then coming back to the point of whether you know teachers are can be skilled or no, they cannot be skilled. There is a huge recession across the world, and teachers can from the best talent can be brought into the classroom, and that is what we have been doing in the we have a B.Tech in Artificial Intelligence teaching now. We have a doctorate from Michigan University teaching Environmental and Science. We have a Masters in Architecture from California School teaching. And in a school which charges 60,000 a year, we have a, we are the only school in the world to have an industrial government operated by six standard by ADD Sweden. We have 3D printers. But when I go to even conferences in Dubai or Singapore, uh, there were two schools that were representing India. And during the lunch, uh, and they are very premium schools. Uh, they were represented by the uh, head of international relations of that group and it was headed by IT head of that group of schools. And the IT head of that school is coming to me and asking me, Sir, you are using 3D printers in the school. Our school is also a So what do you do? The point is, we have realized, seen and executed in the last one and a half years using some of the best methods equipment, infrastructure, which was unbelievable can be used in classrooms and we have got delivery. My problem as a school was when we wanted even a robot, when we sent an inquiry to ABP Sweden or to Luka Japan, they did not respond to us for two months because they felt that it was a free uh, inquiry. But now when they see that their robot can be used by children in 6 standard, 7 standard, 3D printers, laser fabricators or all such, children are doing wonderful jo job of sound engineering. They are creating better sound than what, of a similar track than what uh, Walt Disney or Dolby. It is for us to grab the opportunity. It is within the framework of this curriculum we have to think out of the box 
and we must uh, and that out of box thinking only comes from a threat perception that we may not survive uh, in front of the robots of artificial Okay, I can, uh, I can just tell you one quick funny story uh, related to this. I once did a soul in England with very young children, uh, six year olds. And I said, uh, will robots uh, take over the job of teachers? <laughs> they, they, they can barely read, so they did a bit of searching, but they came back with an uh, excellent conclusion. Uh, they said, no, we don't think this is a good idea because then we will all start talking like robots and that's not a good idea at all. <laughs> so, okay, last comment. Sir, so, yeah. uh, so, uh, current system of education, we have learning outcomes, we have certain assessments, certain, uh, certain concepts to be covered between 6 to 8 standard or whatever the standards we have. Uh, when we take uh, soul, as a learning system uh, in our schools, uh, what will be the learning outcomes? How do we? Uh, uh, I see. I see uh, to my understanding, uh, the questions are uh, the, the way we ask the questions. The uh, learning uh, rubrics or uh, that should be the focus. So, how do we, uh, you know, match this? The learning outcomes, the questions. For example, if you teach any concepts. Yeah, yeah. And how do we take irrelevant subjects out of this current system? How do we decide that as a school leader? Actually, you know, that that is probably, uh, as it turns out, a, a pretty good uh, last comment to come on because what he is saying, and I was uh, waiting to see if that comment will come, is that if you do a soul, what do you evaluate at the end of it? Who has learnt and what have they learnt? Okay, and it, uh, it, it is a... Uh, is actually not at all an easy question to answer. It brings us back to square one in my talk, if you remember, of the murmurating birds. If, if you were to ask what have they done and who has done it, the answer is no single individual has. Now, th this is actually a complicated area, so we're not going to go into that, uh, except to say that if that is the world we are heading towards, where individual assessment will no longer be meaningful at all, it will be what we do as a species that will be left behind for the next species to see or whatever it is. Then only we can build a rubric around that. At the moment, what I do with the children is that I rank the whole class in a soul and say, I would say this is top class what you did. And everybody feels good, although I know everyone hasn't learned the same thing. That's about as far as you can go right now. Well, okay, so that kind of brings us to a close and I'm sorry to be in a hurry, but I have to go back to Calcutta. And uh, uh, it was uh, great as usual. I would suggest that you carry on this sort of a dialogue. Maybe you can use who news if you can get this chap to agree that uh, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, why don't you have a place in the magazine where you can take these three issues of assessment, curriculum and pedagogy, you experiment and he publishes. So instead of going through the route of peer review, this, that, which is very lengthy and you'll never get around to doing it. Instead of that, why can't a magazine play that role so that the other teachers can get a quick idea of things that work and things that don't. And I think you'll find, you'll get a pretty large readership to look at a thing like that. And uh, let the arguments carry on. To, to, somebody might say this worked and somebody says, no, I tried it, it doesn't work. Fine. But I would love to see a dialogue like that go on. Thank you. Thanks very much.